Luke eleven twenty four, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first state. Now I'm going to read it in the Message Bible, Luke 11, 24 through 26. When a corrupting spirit is expelled from someone, it drifts along through the desert looking for an oasis. Some unsuspecting soul, it can bedevil. When it doesn't find anyone, it says, I'll go back to my old haunt. On return, it finds the person swept and dusted, but vacant. It then runs out and rounds up seven other spirits dirtier than itself, and they all move in, whooping it up. That person ends up far worse than if he'd never gotten cleaned up in the first place. So what we see here in Luke 24, I mean in Luke 11, 24 through 26, is Jesus telling very clearly that if somebody cleans up their life, if somebody gets clean in, in an area where they've been dirty, somebody, this could be possession from a demon, but it can also be further than that, oppression, a demon that that lingers in your life, that takes territory in your life, demons that for generations and generations have been able to have a hand in certain parts of your life and certain parts of your emotional well-being and different things like that. Jesus says, when that demon leaves, when that demon is expelled out of a person that's possessed, when that demon has to go away that has been oppressing you and lying to you and stealing from you and feeding you uh, uh, things that fill your evil cravings and your evil hungers, when that thing is finally expelled and finally cast out and finally removed from your life, it says you're not really safe yet. You're not really in a place yet where you can just sit back and chill and say, whew, okay, that, that demon's gone. That thing is done with. It says, no, that demon, that spirit is going to wander off and go find seven other demons, seven other spirits, more dirty, more filthy, more evil, more crazy, more wild than, than that one was, and they're all going to come back to that house. They're all going to come back to that person. And it says if they find that person empty, if they find that person with nothing on the inside, it says it is worse for that person than they were at the beginning with that demon haunting them, with that, with that oppression in their life, with that possession in their life. It says now you're in a worse position because you, you were cleaned, you were freed, you were delivered, but you were never filled. And so Jesus is saying here, when these, when these demons come back and they come back to haunt you, they come back to visit you, they're looking for one thing, emptiness. Are you empty in your soul? Are you empty in your spiritual life? Because if you are, man, seven more are coming. More dirty more filthy, more angry, more outraged than that original place where you were, where you were taken captive by the devil, where you were hindered by the enemy. All of us have these things. We we look at these scriptures and we see spirits and demons and uh, expelling unclean spirits. And we think, oh, that's that crazy spiritual stuff. That's that stuff that's way out there. That's, that's too big. It's, it's, you know, off in that other realm, but we forget that Evil spirits are in, are in simple things like anger, jealousy. It's, it's in simple things like where you have a particular craving that you satisfy that you know is, is wrong, that you know is evil. It's in, it's in simple everyday things where you have a certain train of thought that just constantly, constantly beats you down. Depressed thoughts, depressed thoughts. Where, where, you, where you find yourself thinking pretty consistently, I don't want to be here. 
I don't want to live this life. I want out. I want out. I can't. There's no hope. There's no hope. It's in simple everyday things that we all go through. But when you call it a demon, we freak out. But usually it's demonic spirits that tell you things like there's no way out. There's no hope. You got to get out on your own. You got to just leave. It's it's never going to get better. Just lay there until you die. It's never going to get better. Those are demonic spirits. There's nothing good about that. Those, those angry things that tell you they're, you know, or, or that suspicious spirit where everybody is against you. Everybody's talking bad about you. Nobody likes you. Everybody at your workplace thinks that you're weird. Everybody thinks that you're a problem. Your family even thinks you're a little off. And all of these thoughts that we entertain, sexual thoughts, pornography, these things that continue to come and come back to us and come back to us. It's not a godly spirit. So what is it? These are the evil spirits of the age. These are the evil spirits that are in the world. And the Bible says that at some time in our lives, these spirit have a, have a room in our house. They have a room in our soul. They're, they're dwelling around us and in us and feeding us. And Jesus says, man, when I come in, those uns- unclean spirits get expelled. They have to leave. He says, but the problem here is when you don't fill up that vacant place. And so you're empty. So I've driven something out. That's left a cavity in you that you have not filled. So that evil spirit is going to go run the streets and find more more evil spirits like itself, but stronger. And they're going to come back. And those lies are going to intensify. And those those lustful images are going to intensify. And that rage is going to intensify into tantrums. And that iniquity that's in your blood, the iniquity is, is, is sin passed down from generation to generation to generation. It just keeps living. And, and the Bible says iniquity waxes stronger with each generation. It means it gets stronger and stronger. So your great-great-grandfather... Uh, was was really an angry man and then your great-grandfather was an angry abusive man and then your grandfather was an angry abusive crazy man and now it gets on you and you're you're the the enemy's trying to turn you into an angry abusive crazy insane schizophrenic outraged tantrum throwing person because the 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 germ of iniquity gets worse and worse and worse. So the iniquity grows and continues. And Jesus says, but when I come in, that goes out. It's very simple. When I come into your life, I expel unclean spirits. I expel lustful images. I expel those tantrums. I expel iniquity. I expel evil and dirty and nasty things. I expel those vindictive, jealous ways. I get rid of them. They have to go. But if you don't fill yourself where those things are now gone, you have a cavity in your soul waiting to be filled by somebody. And the Bible says that the devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So he's going to come back and look at that cavity in your soul and say, oh, man, it's, it's, it's even wider now. It's a deeper hole now. It hasn't been filled. There's nothing, there's nothing in there, so there's room for us. So now this, this thing that captivated you and held you, you can't believe it's come back. Because you said, man, I know that God healed me. I know God expelled that spirit. I know that oppression lifted. I know that things changed. Why is it coming back? Why is it worse? Have you filled yourself with the opposite spirit? Have you filled yourself with the holy word of God? Have you filled yourself with the presence? Have you filled yourself with intimacy with God where that cavity, where those spirits were driven out is full of rivers of living water? Jesus is saying here, I'll drive them out, but then you have work to do. I'm going to drive these spirits out just by my presence alone. But now you've got to go and feed on the word of God. The Bible says in Matthew 5 that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. 
So he's saying you've got to get hungry where that cavity is left in your soul. God has delivered you from pornography. Now there's this huge cavity where there used to be this craving and this and this uh, pleasure and this place in your heart and in your mind. Now there's a huge cavity there. And God says you've got to go to the word and fill your spirit with new images. Fill your spirit with new entertainment where the word of God becomes alive to you like pictures on a screen. You used to be outraged and angry and you had this huge part of you that was made up of of anger and rage. Now God drives that out and the word of God says you hunger and thirst after righteousness. So you start feeding on the word of God about patience and the fruits of the spirit and you're feeding your soul. You're feeding that cavity with good food with good things, and you become full of patience and peace and power. And those demons come back to look, and they say, man, we can't go in because it's full. There's no empty rooms. That room's full of peace, and that room's full of patience, and that room's full of power. We can't come back with these lustful, perverted thoughts and images because that room is full of holiness and that room is full of purity and that room is full of family and marriage and covenant and godly ideas we can't go in there because that cavity has been filled with god things so jesus says i'll drive it out it's not a problem i'll I'll drive every evil thing out of your life but now you must eat You must eat the word, drink the water of the word. You must come to my presence and sit. Sometimes people hear, you know, get in the presence of God, get before God. What does that look like? It it looks like go close the door to your room and get on your knees by yourself and close your eyes so you close out the rest of the world and you begin to talk to God. Matthew 6, Jesus says, go to your room, close the door, get in private all by yourself and just start talking to God and you tell God everything and God tells you things and you have a relationship with God. Then that empty cavity begins to be full of God. And then demons come back to try to revisit, to try to recaptivate, and that hole is filled with God. Demons and God don't mix, so the demons aren't going to come in. They're not going to try anything because they find that hole filled with the very thing they're terrified of. That's God. So then you see in Luke eleven nine, 9, Jesus says, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? And if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your, will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus is saying, come to me and ask to be filled with good things. Seek after me because you're going to find. There, there are things in the world we seek after, and when we seek after them, they leave us continuing to seek. Because you never can find it. I'm seeking for something in sex and I cannot find it. I'm, I'm seeking something in these, in these highs and in these drugs and in these different things. I cannot find it. So I keep seeking deeper, deeper, deeper. I'm seeking for something to heal my soul in these friends and in these people and in these relationships. It never works. I keep searching. I keep searching. It's not filling. It's not filling. And Jesus says, seek and you're going to find in me. When you seek me, you're going to find. I don't play games. I'm not teasing you. I'm not the world. Will I feel you to a certain extent and then I dip out and then you're left craving and aching for something you can't have. You seek me and you find me. You ask for me and I will give good things godly things and you knock on my door and I'm going to answer that door to you 
But when you look at what it's really saying and you break down the original language, it says keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. You don't come to the door one time and baby knock on that door, and whenever it doesn't get open, just walk away and leave. He's saying, bang on the door, knock and knock and knock and knock until I come because I'm worth it when I answer it. Seek and seek and seek and seek in the word. Seek, seek out God and everything that you can because you are going to find and keep asking me to fill you. Keep asking for water. Keep asking for, for food from heaven because I'm going to give it to you because everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. So God is saying, where I have driven out these spirits, come and ask me to fill you. Lord, for so long, I, I've been jealous, and now you've removed that spirit. Now fill me. Fill me with that spirit that cheers and applauds for everybody. Fill me with that spirit of trust, where I trust you. That whatever you want to give me, you will give me. And what I don't have, you don't want me to have. I trust that. I'm secure in that. I don't need to have her looks and her gifts and her body and her abilities because I have mine. Fill me with trust that I can trust in you that who you've made me to be is enough. Fill me with your word. In Psalms, where it talks about me being wonderfully made, fearfully made, that you know my thoughts and you love me still, that you intricately put me together. God, fill me with that. Because jealousy is driven out, but I've got to be filled with the opposite spirit. So, Lord, fill me where I have been emptied. God, for so long, I've, I've had these sexual images, these lustful images. I fed that craving. Now you've driven it out and there's emptiness there. So now fill me with an intimacy I've never known. Fill me with an intimacy of the Holy Spirit coming into my room and, and being face to face with me and teaching me, and loving me, and touching my soul. We sing these songs, Jesus, lover of my soul. But I wonder if we ever stop and like think about the fact that that song says, lover of my soul. Just stop and take one word out, lover. What's a lover? It's somebody you're intimate with, you touch, you exchange things, you, 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 you completely put your soul and their soul, you put them together in one and they, they intertwine. So you're saying, Jesus, lover of my soul, can my soul mix with yours, God? And then you come completely into me and you take me completely into you and you put something in me that, that impregnates me with godly things. The Bible says, uh, uh, John writes about, he, uh, in 1 John, he says, uh, you don't sin because you have God's seed in you. That word seed is the word for sperm. You don't sin because God's sperm is in you. Now, you got to be spiritually minded. you got to be mature. But this is in your, in your Bible. This is in the word of God. John is saying, you, you've, you've become so intimate with God where your soul has touched the soul of God. And now you've come together with him. And he put his seed in you. He put his promise in you. And now you're pregnant with something from God, Mary. And now you have to carry that. And now when the devil comes to see if you're empty, you're pregnant. So you're not empty and your womb is not empty. So the enemy can come and, and plant seeds in you. You're full. You're full of God. You're full of his seed. You're full of his promise. And there is something growing in your soul that you're going to carry and you're going to birth into the world. This is in the Bible. Read it. Study it. The Bible is the most intimate place, the most intimate book I have ever read in my life. And so Jesus is saying, when I drive out those unclean spirits, you must fill yourself with me. You must fill yourself with my presence, with my word, with a relationship. 
And I'm going to read it in the message again. When a corrupting spirit is expelled from someone, it drifts along through the desert looking for an oasis. Demons like dry places. Demons like dry places. So if your relationship with God is dry, you need to go deeper. If your marriage is dry, you need to go deeper. If your friendships are dry, if your church is dry, if your personality is dry, just keep in mind that demons love dry places. When it doesn't find someone, it says it goes into dry places to look for some unsuspecting soul, it can be devil. And when it doesn't find anyone, it says, I'll go back to my old haunt. I'll go back to the old house. And on return, it finds the person swept and dusted, but vacant. You cleaned up, but you didn't fill up. You cleaned up. You got rid of the magazines. You got rid of the websites. You got rid of the, the audio. You got rid of the music. You got rid of the people. You got rid of the drinks. You got rid of the smokes. You got rid of the stuff, but you didn't fill it up with anything. So it's vacant. It then runs out and rounds up seven other demons dirtier than itself, and they all move in. And that person ends up far worse than if he'd never gotten cleaned up in the first place. Jesus says, it's really smart for you to fill yourself up once I drive things out. Go into that word and eat it. Drink it. Become it. You've got to crave after the word. If, if you spent hours and hours and hours watching pornography, if you spent hours and hours and hours fighting in outraged relationships, if you spent hours and hours and hours obsessing in depression, obsessing over, over things that were just consuming your spirit, lies, you just ate those lies and you fed on those lies, if you spent hours and hours just drinking and smoking and taking the pills and taking the drugs and, and filling yourself how much more time should be spent in the word we we go from these places where we spend hours feeding on the devil's food and then we go whenever we we get in love with the lord and he cleans us and he heals us we go and we read a verse a day we get a verse a day on our phone and we read that in the morning and that's all we fill up with we, we, we take our verse of the day and we have, you know, five minutes that we have of that verse and we expect that verse to fill us up of a hole that big where prior to that we spent hours doing the opposite. So what the Lord is saying is now you've got to spend hours in the word. And it's not this idea of like, oh, my God, I have to sit here and read this word. I've got to sit here and be in his and pray and pray. No, it's an idea of a relationship where you cannot get enough. I can't get enough of this word. I can't get enough of the words in red where Jesus spoke. I can't get enough of these absurd, crazy, truthful stories. I can't get enough of God who completes my soul. I can't get enough of the spirit. I can't get enough in worship. I can't get enough of it because, because I'm craving now God things. I'm craving God's heart now. I'm craving God's kingdom now. So I'm desperately filling myself up. Verse of the day is not enough. A scripture a day, it's not enough for how much you allowed the enemy to feed you before. You've got to let God feed you as much and more than your enemy ever did. So that you're not vacant. Then if you look at John chapter 7, verse 37, it says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So this is crazy because... What, what's happening here is they have just had all of the, the, the feast times. 
They've just been in the festivals. These festivals were like religious, like conferences, like church conferences. Like we have a seven-day conference, and every day, like the greatest speakers in the world are there. And we've got the greatest worship teams leading worship, and everybody's in these rooms, and we're all doing these customs, and we're all doing what we're used to doing. So that's what basically Jesus is saying this after these festivals. These feasts have been happening. These festivals have been happening. There's been so much religious content. There's been so much biblical information. There has been so much worship, so much music. And then it says that the, on the last day, so you've had this huge conference. Everybody's speaking. Everybody's worshiping. We're going through all the routines, greeting each other, laying hands on each other, praying for each other, prophesying over each other. Everybody's in there. It says, but on the last day, that great day of the feast, the grand finale of the religious festivals, Jesus stood and cried out. And, and this is what's also crazy about the word. Oftentimes we read it like this. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But the original word for cried, it says Jesus stood and cried. Jesus stood and cried. The actual original language in the Greek, that word cried means he screamed at the top of his lungs. He screamed until his voice cracked. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He, Jesus is saying, they've been drinking all week. They've had food all week. They've been together all week. It says now on the last day, Jesus is saying, I know none of the religious activities have filled you. I know these repetitious motions have not filled your soul. So he goes out on the last day. This is why Jesus was a crazy, crazy man. And I love him and I follow him because I find a lot of my identity in somebody who's this crazy and wild. He goes outside. All the religious leaders are there. All the church people are there. And he stands up on the last day of the feast and he says, I know none of this stuff has been enough. So I'm going to stand here and I'm going to scream at the top of my lungs. If anyone thirsts, come to me and drink. Because he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is saying, if you come to me, I'll fill you up. If you come to me, I will fill you up. And not only will I fill you up, but you will be overflowing to where there are rivers flowing out of your soul. Living water will flow out of your heart. You won't just be, these, these demons are going to go round up their seven and come back to you and they can't even get close enough because they're drowning in the rivers coming out of you. They can't even get close to you because they're drowning in the rivers coming out of you. You must be filled with rivers of living water. Then can't nothing touch you. Demons cannot swim in the waters of God. Demons cannot swim in healing rivers. Jesus said, if anyone thirsts, you come to me. If you are thirsty, come to me. You cannot feel your thirst in people. You cannot feel your thirst in comfortable relationships where you know somebody's ride or die. It's not enough. You cannot feel yourself in books and literature. It's not enough. You cannot feel yourself in movies that, 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 numb your soul. You cannot feel yourself in social clubs, in social media, in social acceptance. It's not enough. You cannot feel yourself in religious experience. It's not enough. You get your, you get your thirst quenched in Christ alone. If anyone thirsts, come to me. And I love that he says anyone because he's talking about that demon-possessed person who was vacant and seven came back and seven filled him. And made him dirtier than before and filthier than before and crazier than before and angrier than before and more jealous than before and more iniquitous than before. Because he's saying, even that person, you come to me, I'll fill you up. Maybe you made the mistake where Christ touched you and he healed you and he freed you and those things were driven out and then you became empty and dull and dry. 
and more demons came. Seven more. Jesus says, if anyone, if anyone thirsts. So even that person who slipped up and God delivered you and you forgot to go back to God, like those, those, those leprous men who had leprosy and Jesus healed them all. And how many came back? One. And Jesus says, where's the other ones? I didn't just heal one, did I? Only, only one came back to the source. But Jesus says, if anyone thirsts. So Jesus may have driven out those demons from your life and you became vacant. You forgot to go back to him. You forgot to thank him every day that you were delivered. You got dry. You started sleeping. And those seven came back and haunted you even more than before. Seven came in and filled a hole that was bigger than before. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts. I know I, I know I healed you before and you fell asleep on me and now there's seven more. But if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. I, I know that I drove it out and you let it come back in. But if anyone thirsts, I know you used to, you used to be on point. And now you're so far off. But if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me. As the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And those, those rivers of living water, this is what is so wonderful. This is what is so great about being filled with God, being filled with the Holy Spirit, being filled with the waters of Christ. This is what's so miraculous, that your living waters can flow out and touch dry places. The living water that, that's flowing through you. You used to be empty too. You used to be empty too. You used to be vacant too, but he touched you and he touched you so strong and you kept, you kept going to him. You kept going to that river. You kept going as the deer pants after the water brook, so my soul pants after you. You kept going to those rivers and going to those rivers. And now you've got this river flowing in and out of you like power. And it's so powerful that it has the ability to touch other people's dry places. So now you have other people that have demons coming against them and armies coming against them, filthier, dirtier, angrier demons than before, more wicked. But your, your rivers are living and your rivers are potent. And so they go and they touch the dry places of the people around you. So now not only are you filled, not only do you have rivers of living water coming in and out of you, but now you're touching dry places. Does this mean that now no spirit ever comes against you? Does this mean now that no demons come against you, that you're not going to have any, any opposition? No. There's not a chance that this is what that means. But what it means is they have no power. They have no room. They have no reservation. When, when, when the demons come in, it's crazy because we, we can become so dry and so vacant, and we are believers. But the enemy can come into the, to the door of our soul and check in at the front and say, do you have any open rooms? Oh, yeah, there's an open room on floor three up to the left. There's an open room down here. There's an open room over here. Which one do you want to take? Well, I'll take that one, and he'll take that one, and she'll take that one, and they'll take this one. And, and, and they can take occupancy in our lives. Because we've, we've allowed certain places to be dry. We can't let any part of our lives not have the touch of God on it. If it doesn't have the touch of God, it's dry. You have a friendship, make sure it's full of living water. You have a relationship, make sure it's full of living water. You have a church, make sure it's full of living water. You have a family, make sure it's full of living water. You have a hobby, make sure it's full of living water. You have a passion, make sure it's full of living water, which means every bit of your life comes out of intimacy with God. Every part of your life stems from the relationship you have with God. So I have this friendship based on my love for God. I have this relationship based on my love for God. I have this family based on my love for God. I write these books based on my love for God. I have these passions based on my love for God. So every single thing you do is wet with 
water from the spring of God. Everything you do has rivers of living water flowing from it because God has touched it in a place of intimacy. So any demons that come against you, when they come, they see God's touch. We can't touch her. She's been touched. We can't touch that. It's been touched. We can't touch him. He's been touched. Now, they might scream lies at you and shoot arrows of lies and arrows of deception. They may be hollering out from the gate, but they can't come in and live in your house. I have, I have every day lies from the enemy come against me that I can hear in my soul. Jade, you can't do it. You're not, you're not made for this like you think you are. It's too much for you. This is too big for you. You're not big enough. You're not smart enough. You're not capable enough. You're not anything enough. Shut it down before it gets started and you embarrass yourself. Shut it down. You're just like everybody else. You're a human like everybody else. There's, so you're going to fall like everybody else. You're going to look a fool like everybody else. You're not going to have any real impact. You're just going to be a joke out there. So they lie to me, and they're screaming out because that's what the devil is. He's a liar. The Bible says he's the father of all lies. That's why you shouldn't be a liar. He's the father of all lies. So he's lying and he's lying and he's screaming these lies at me, but he can't come live with me. He can't come lay in my bed because my room's full. My house is full. And you can't get close enough without drowning in in these waters. But to say that I'm not attacked by the devil, to say that there aren't lies that come against me, I'd be lying to you. And to say that I'm not tempted and that I'm not conflicted and that I don't go through hard times hard as hell would be a lie but I have rivers of living water flowing through me because I have gone to God in the areas where he has set me free and in the areas where I'm not perfect I'm seeking out the perfect one So there's always a water in my life there. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, if you're empty and dry, you're thirsty. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus says, I'm going to come in. I drive out every evil spirit. I drive out every image. I drive out every negative thing in your life just with my presence. And now where all those things have been driven out, you have to ask me to come in and fill it. Jesus doesn't do anything in your life that you don't ask him to do, allow him to do. That's why when Jesus was in the the garden of Gethsemane, he said to his father, your will be done and your kingdom come because Jesus had a choice. He had a choice. The cup could pass from him. It wasn't like he didn't have a choice. He had a real choice. And he said, your kingdom come, God, your will be done, not mine, but yours. Your will be done in my life. So Jesus is saying, when I drive that thing out and you have that empty space in you, ask me to fill it. Come to me. Invite me. Pull me in. Bring me closer. I want to be close to you. I want to fill you. I want to be all in your life, but I don't force that on you because I've given you free will. You call on me because you want me. God is incredible in the fact that he has personality. 
We act like God's like this big cloud in the sky that just has no personality, no soul. He has no emotions. The reason that it says cast your cares on the, on the Lord for he cares for you, you would break it down and look at it. He's saying he's sad when you're sad. He, he's hurting when you're hurting. That's what that means. Cast your cares on me for I care for you. Give me your sadness because I'm sad for you. And if you give it to me, I can heal you, and then we, I become happy with you. That's why the word says, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. They're saying, be like God, because God's like that. He, he's happy when you're happy. He's loving you. And then when you're hurting and you're down, he hurts with you. He's, he's an emotional being. That's why it says you were created in the image of God. That's why we have a soul. And we have emotions because God, God is the same way. He's got emotions. He cares. And what, what I love about him and the fact that he has a personality is God wants to be wanted by you. God wants you to want him, not just like, okay, God, I know that this is your word, so I have to come to you and give you my life, and I have to invite you in, and I have to give you place, and I have to do this, and I have to do that. It's like, no, God wants you to want him the same way you want your partner to want you, the same way you want your friends to want you. That's how God is. He, he wants to be wanted and desired by you in a love relationship. And he says, you want me like that, I'm coming for you. I'm going to come so close. I'm going to be there. But you have to ask and seek and knock. So my encouragement to you is don't be dry. Don't be vacant. Don't be empty. If God has driven something out of your life, an old demon, don't be surprised when it comes back. It's just a principle of the word. It doesn't mean you're evil. It doesn't mean something's wrong with you. It doesn't mean you've got some weird genetics. It's the word. If these demons come back and they're haunting you and you're falling into things and you're slipping and you're tripping, don't, don't freak out. Go to the river. Go to Christ. Go to the living water and drink of it. But my encouragement is be filled. Go to the word and eat it and eat it and eat it and drink it. Go to his presence. Go to your room and close your door and put on worship music. And on your knees, just lift your hands like, like a hungry, like somebody who's hungry. You know, in Africa, there were these kids. They'd stand in line. I was in Africa for uh, two and a half months, basically. And these kids would come line up for beans and rice, and they just hold their hands out. They just hold their hands out in front of them because you're about to feed them, and they're hungry. Get on your knees and just hold your hands out like you want the beans and rice of the kingdom. Hold your hands out like you're hungry. God, I need you to fill me. I need you to, to restore me. I need you to give me new images. I need new pictures. I need new relationships. I need new friendships. I need new cravings. I need new hungers. I need new thirsts. I need new hobbies. I need a new life. I need new thoughts. I need new dreams because my dreams are, are, are evil, angry, sexual. My dreams are twisted and confused. My dreams go back in my past and haunt me. My dreams are fears of the future and they haunt me. That's a place you need to be filled because God will speak to you in your dreams. God will fill your sleep life. God will fill every part of you that has become vacant, that has become empty, or that has become full of the wrong things. If anyone thirsts, if you are thirsty, go to Jesus. Close your door, get on your knees, put your hands in front of you, and ask for him to come into your life. Ask him to come into those areas. Get by yourself on your lunch break. Go get some nuggets from Wendy's, whatever. Drive to the parking lot. Stop. Put your car in park and read the word while you sit there and eat. Feed on it. Feed on it. God, you have to fill me. You have to fill me. 
Whatever you have to do to fill yourself with the person of Jesus Christ, do it.